Thousands of women travel abroad every year looking for sun, sea and romance. I thought he was one of the most beautiful men I'd ever seen in my life. Charismatic, he was charming. I was attracted to his humour and his friendliness, but I was still very cautious that it's just a holiday romance. Some of the men they meet spark instant attraction. He was absolutely devastatingly handsome, I must admit. But sometimes holiday relationships don't last. I felt neglected, I felt suspicious that he's cheating. And the man of your dreams can become your worst nightmare. I got an email from this woman telling me that they were married. These women have been left brokenhearted by accusations of bigamy. He had married a new wife. I could not believe it. And have to fight for justice against the man they thought they knew. He needs to be in prison. In southeast England, music promoter Kim is watching her wedding video with friend Nicola. This is what they call the marriage celebration in Senegal. She married 44-year-old Lai So during a holiday in Senegal in 2007 when she was 50. I didn't get a cake, I got a goat that was sacrificed for me. <laughs> when Kim was introduced to musician Lai in the UK earlier that year, her attraction to him was instant. I thought he was one of the most beautiful men I'd ever seen in my life. Charismatic, he was charming. He said that he was a widower with three children. And so I shared with him very early on that I too had lost two children. I was carrying twins, I lost them. After sharing their most intimate secrets, Kim began to dream of a new life with Lai and his children. We talked about the children all the time. I began to have dreams of us all being together as a happy family. Lai was soon pressing Kim for a permanent commitment. Marriage was talked about quite early in the relationship. He said to me almost every day how much he loved me. So, looking back, you think this was genuine at the time? Or... <laughs> I thought it was 100% genuine. And even now, looking at the video, I can't see it. Years after her wedding, Kim says she was told Lai may have been hiding a huge secret. Family members later on were to tell me that he was already married. And after all, surely I knew he was already married. Kim's nightmare at the hands of a man she now suspects of bigamy was just beginning. Personal assistant D was on holiday in Suez, Tunisia, in the year 2000, recovering from the breakdown of her previous marriage. I was really distraught, and my cousin Cynthia said, let's go on holiday to Tunisia just to have a break. While relaxing in the port, she met a dashing student called Ahmed. I've actually got two photos here of when Ahmed and I first met. He was absolutely devastatingly handsome, I must admit. He was very charming, and he was tall as well. When you get a compliment, or someone takes an interest in you when you're in this vulnerable place, you don't sort of think they're trying to scam you. Dee stayed in contact with Ahmed after returning to her home in Bedfordshire, and their affection for one another grew into a relationship. I thought, you know, we suited each other. He did make me laugh. I found him quite funny at times and he liked my cooking. After several holidays to visit Ahmed in Sousse, Dee married him in a Tunisian civil ceremony in 2003. This is us, the night of the party. The party was kept on the roof of a house. It's me and him. It looked like sort of Beckham and Posh there. <laughs> I don't laugh, joke, joke. I thought these were happy days, happy times. After their marriage, Ahmed moved to the UK and worked as a hospital porter. Dee decided to invest in a property in Tunisia. We built a really, really nice house, and um, he'd actually taken a lot of stuff from the house in um, England to put in that house. 
In July 2009, Ahmed was loading up the car to furnish their Tunisian home and also to visit his sick father. This is the lay-by where Ahmed pulled into on the morning when he left to go to Tunisia. The car was laden and he couldn't go up the hill again. So he phoned me at home and asked me to um, bring his wedding ring. I came down here with the wedding ring to give to Ahmed, not knowing that Ahmed was going to use the ring for his marriage 11 days later to a Tunisian woman. Ahmed's father died, so Ahmed extended his stay in Tunisia. But in August, Dee received a devastating email from his cousin. I um, had uh, an email to ask me if I've divorced Ahmed. I said, no, what are you talking about? We're still living together. The email was enough for Dee to do further research via a friend in Tunisia. Her worst fears were soon confirmed. I found out that he had married a new wife. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. But bigger battles with Ahmed lay ahead for Dee. In Bournemouth, care worker Julie is reminiscing with her friend Ben about her 2007 holiday to the Gambia, West Africa. Why did you start to like him? He was a gentleman, wasn't he? He carried all my bags, my water. During her holiday, Julie, who was 45 at the time, met 30-year-old Lamin. He was very physically attractive, athletic. I thought very handsome. I was attracted to his humour and his friendliness, but I was still very cautious that it's just a holiday romance. After three failed marriages, Julie admits she was susceptible to Lamin's charm. I was quite vulnerable, I was getting old. He made me feel like I was unique. Julie returned to Bournemouth, but Lamin remained in contact. I thought, maybe this is the man for me for the rest of my life. And I thought, and I can improve his life and his situation. 12 months later, in November 2008, Julie booked another holiday to marry Lamin in a Gambian registry office. It wasn't the wedding Julie had hoped for. Before the wedding, the woman said, have you got a dress? I said, yes, I have. Why? She opened a filing cabinet and she said, I've got a dress here, rent a dress, one size fits all. I said, you're kidding me. And there's people in a queue waiting to get married after you. Julian Lamin tied the knot, but their romance didn't last long. We spent the whole of our honeymoon filling visa forms in. The whole honeymoon was destroyed. That little nagging thing in my head that was saying, are you doing the right thing or not? I wish I'd listened to it now. Lamin came to the UK in 2008 and told Julie he'd find work as a builder. But his efforts at assembling Julie's shed cast some doubt on his construction qualifications. He said he'd build it, but it's not right. It's upside down, partly. There's gaps here that's hanging off. The roof is just rotting. The window's not right and hanging off. And all the floor's not done. What a mess. Just a bit like our relationship was. It's a memento of what I married and what I've been left with. As they tried to build a life together in the UK, it wasn't just Lamin's DIY skills that left Julie disappointed. He's going out with his friends, drinking. I felt neglected, I felt suspicious that he's cheating. The growing crime, known as romance fraud, is a global concern. In Goliad, Texas, 66-year-old Linda's story began in 2011, when Larry, her husband of 21 years, passed away. He was my soulmate. We thought we'd just grow old and die together, but it didn't happen that way. He wanted me to move on with my life, and he said, 
I want you to meet a really Christian good man and, and remarry. To help her get over her loss, Linda's daughters suggested internet dating. By July 2012, she found herself in an online relationship with a 56-year-old man called Steve Charway. He ticked all the right boxes for a vulnerable widow. He was gentle, he was kind and caring, and he tells me, far in distance, but near in heart, you'll always be my angel to my heart. He made me feel a little young again. I think she was very naive to the internet. Her and her husband had been together for so long. When she lost him, she, she lost a lot. Steve told Linda that he worked in investments and was often based in Ghana, West Africa. He could explain everything away. He always was able to make you feel like it was okay, and he just had a way. He, he just knew how to do it. It wasn't long before Steve offered a long-term commitment to end Linda's loneliness. He had asked me to be his wife, and we were going to be married. I decided I was going to go to Ghana. We would be married there, and then we would come back here. By this stage of the relationship, Linda had also been providing Steve with money and gifts, sometimes at his request, occasionally at her discretion. This is the uh, money that I actually sent to Steve. And uh, these were for hotel bills, food, medicines, different things that he would say that he needed. As her trip to Ghana for her wedding approached in July 2013, Linda was thrilled at the opportunity to restart her life. I just couldn't wait. We were talking about when we got to the airport, I was just going to wrap my arms around him and wrap my legs around him and kiss him and kiss him and kiss him. But on arrival at the Ghanaian airport, Linda was greeted by an unfamiliar face calling her name. Someone said, Linda. And I looked around and it was a young black man in a suit and tie, dressed, dressed very nicely. And I walked over to him and I said, who are you? And he said, I'm pastor. Well, Steve had talked about pastor. In fact, the pastor was going to marry us. He, he said, Steve sent me to pick you up. He's at the church working. Linda traveled to the hotel with the pastor, where she was expecting to meet Steve. But as she waited, she learned the shocking truth. I was starting to be very upset. And I said, he's not coming, is he? And he kind of dropped his head and he said, Linda, do you love Steve? And I said, yes, I must, or I wouldn't have come halfway around the world. He handed me a little church bulletin and it said Pastor Steve Chairway and then he said I'm Steve I fell apart totally fell apart I mean he said I'm still the same man inside even though my skin is black and he said everything I've told you for the last year has been a lie but now I'm going to tell you the truth I truly love you and I want us to be married the picture Linda was originally sent was of an unknown man. We've been unable to identify or trace him, but there is no suggestion he was in any way aware that his photograph was being used by Steve. This photograph also appears on a lot of other websites. The way Steve used his charm to win Linda around is typical of the men we are featuring in this program. Each victim has a story to tell on just how charismatic their ex-partners could be. They must go to some sort of charm school to learn all the things that would make somebody who has a very low self-esteem feel really, really good about themselves. He was compassionate and kind and gentle, and he started telling me how much he loved me, and he would tell me how much God loved me, and he, he would say, you're in my prayers. When I met Lamin, he promised me that he'd be there till the end of my days. I'd go after you, he said. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. He really made me feel age wasn't a factor. 
and that he was a serious man and that what he was looking for was a life partner with somebody who could be the mother to his children. Kim believed she was living a happy and monogamous life with Lai So for five years, until in January 2013, when things began to unravel. Musician Lai, then 49, was in Senegal making preparations for his children to move to the UK, into a house Kim had bought for them all to live in. Suddenly I get this phone call. I've lost my credit cards. I can't pay the school fees. I need some money. So I sent over all the money that I had at that time on me. Around this time, Kim noticed Lai had removed his property from her house. He had taken all of his smart suits, winter clothes, etc. And suddenly I realized he had gone. Kim used social media to notify her friends and contacts of Lai's unexpected departure. This is when all hell broke loose. Suddenly I had loads of women contacting me. Kim was inundated with women making claims about Lai. She says she was sent photos of one of the women she was being told Lai was married to. Suddenly I was being sent pictures of his wife in the house, pictures of the children cuddled up on the wife. Kim was receiving repeated allegations about her husband. I still to this day don't know how many children he's got. I'd learnt about five wives. I could not move. I was rigid in trauma. As the allegations came thick and fast, Kim didn't know what to believe. She struggled to cope, and the toll on her led to a near fatal accident. I actually drank a bottle of vodka, staggered up the stairs, and I ended up falling down there. And I still to this day don't know how I didn't kill myself. And actually, I didn't even care whether I lived or died at that point. Care worker Julie married Lamin Sidibe after a whirlwind romance that began on holiday in the Gambia in 2007, when she was 45. When 31-year-old Lamin had his visa confirmed 18 months later, he moved to the UK and eventually found work at a Bournemouth fish and chip shop. But Julie says the money he earned wasn't spent on going out with her. He'd be coming in about two, three in the morning. I'd be worried. And he'd say, stop phoning me. He said, but I'm worried, you're my husband. You know, and I have a right to know where you are. Two months after being given official permission to stay in the UK in March 2010, Lamin left the marital home. He came home with a bunch of flowers and said, I'm leaving. I said, pack your bags now. Weeks later, Julie says she was contacted by another English woman who made a sensational claim about Lamin. My marriage might not have been legal. She told me that they were married. She said, I tried to get him a visa so many times, it was refused. So he hit the jackpot with me because I had a house, a job, I could afford to keep him. We have tried to contact the woman who claimed to be married to Lamin, but she did not respond to our request. Julie remains unsure if this allegation made in the phone call was true. But her nightmare with Lamin is not over. He still lives in Bournemouth. I hate it when I bump into him and I see that he's just getting on with life. Julie now wonders about the real reason Lamin entered a relationship with her. The only thing he came for was a visa, passport, have a better life than he had there. It was his escape. But he's got what he wanted, but it wasn't me. Dee met her ex-husband Ahmed on holiday in Sousse, Tunisia. In 2009, she was left devastated when she discovered that 34-year-old Ahmed had divorced her and remarried without her knowledge. I phoned him and I said, Ahmed, I've been hearing rumours that you've divorced me behind my back and you've remarried. And he said, um, you, yes, yes, me and my new wife were very happy. 
Better do not give me troubles because it is not good for you or for me. Before he left, Ahmed had asked Dee to lend him £36,000 to buy a car while he was over in Tunisia. What he told me was that he was buying like a Jeep in Egypt and he can bring it back to Tunisia, sell it for double the amount and then he'd be able to give me back the money. With her bank account emptied and her husband thousands of miles away, Dee was left in a state of shock. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. My, my heart was sort of just racing. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I didn't crumble. I'm still strong and will continue to be until I get satisfaction. That's all I can say. Dee decided she wasn't going to be beaten by Ahmed and began to fight back. Via a Tunisian lawyer, she found evidence that Ahmed had falsified her divorce papers. He'd sent the divorce papers to a false address in Wembley and the Tunisian court would not accept this. So he had to concoct a story to say I was um, living in Tunisia and he served the divorce papers there. Ahmed was able to convince a Tunisian solicitor to sign off on his illegal divorce papers. Dee was able to track the solicitor down in September 2010. They admitted to signing the divorce papers. This confession uh, was a turning point for me, to be able to get Ahmed to trial. She said she spoke to a lady with an English sounding voice in London. So obviously Ahmed had got someone to impersonate me. Dee was able to prove in Tunisian court that Ahmed had divorced her illegally and that he'd taken thousands of pounds from her by deception. After Ahmed failed in his appeal to the court, they issued a stern punishment. In April 2014, the Tunisian court, in their wisdom, realised that their original suspended three-year sentence was too, too lenient. So they've converted it to a prison sentence for three years. By the time Ahmed's appeal had been overturned, he'd already returned to the UK. Dee now believes he's evading Tunisian jail by living in Cambridge. If he touches down in Tunisia, they will arrest him. But what will the British police do here? Because basically I want the man arrested for the crimes he's committed In 2013, music promoter Kim was preparing her home in the UK for her Senegalese partner, Lai, and his children. Yes, these were the beds for the first two children to use. Pretty sad. But after she received social media messages suggesting Lai may have had multiple relationships and even marriages, she hit her lowest ebb. My children had gone, my husband had gone. I lost everything so quickly. Having drunk a bottle of vodka and fallen down the stairs, Kim was rescued after neighbours alerted the emergency services. The only thing I could say to the paramedics was no, 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 no. It was all too much to, to take on board. How come I haven't seen what was going on? But the nightmare at the hands of a man she fears may be a bigamist is far from over for Kim. Kim now suspects that the end game all along was for Lai to get her rental property. He sued me for divorce on the grounds of my unreasonable behaviour and uh, put charges on my property so that I wasn't able to sell the property. He's trying to evict the tenants. He's trying to take my uh, money through the divorce procedure. He thinks that he can take my assets away from me. Kim is fighting to keep her property out of the hands of her love rat husband, Lai. Kim believes if she can find evidence he committed bigamy, then Lai won't be able to make claims on her house. Kim has been sent a video by a former associate of Lai's, which we are unable to show for legal reasons. 
I have a lovely wife. If she's beautiful and she loves me a thousand percent. I've heard those words so many times. Tonight, Kim is watching the video, which was shot in 2003 for the first time. Only my wife understands me. How many times have I heard that? It shows Lai repeatedly referring to another woman as his wife four years before he was married to Kim. Now I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the real person. Charming, good-looking, smooth-talking. I've heard all those words before. They've been said to me. Seeing the video has stirred up some strong emotions for Kim, who hopes it is evidence that helps prove lies bigamy. What a total utter shit. I am so angry. I am so... I have words. I have no words. I am so angry. He needs to be in prison. I hope it's a smoking gun that we need. This will be handed to the police. We have it quite clearly said on camera. My wife, my wife. American Linda was on holiday in Ghana in July 2013 to meet the man of her dreams, 47-year-old Steve Charway. But it turned out the man 66-year-old Linda had been sending thousands of dollars to wasn't the middle-aged white man she'd seen online, but a young black man. I looked in his eyes and he said, I'm the same person. I'm just, my skin color is black, but I'm the same person inside. The shock left Linda reeling. It was horrible. I was blown completely apart. My heart was broken. It hurt really bad. So I told him, I said, Steve, I, I can't marry you right now. I said, I, I need to get a ticket and go home. Linda booked on the next available flight home. But in the time waiting for her flight, Steve was able to show that the man she'd fallen in love with online was every bit as charming in the flesh. I had to wait four days. Well, during that time, he was very, very sweet and gentle and kind and good. And I was falling more in love with him, actually. And I began to regret the fact that I had changed my ticket to come home. Once she'd returned home, Linda couldn't stop thinking about Steve. I knew that I still cared for him, I still loved him, and I guess I was really mixed up. He was begging me and he was saying, why won't you marry me, why won't you come back? Linda relented and booked another holiday to Ghana in October 2013. But days before she was due to fly, she made a shocking discovery. On his Facebook, this uh, woman had written a message to him telling him, you already know how much I love you and soon the whole world will know. And that's how I found out that there was another woman. Linda's daughter found evidence that Steve was in regular contact with the other woman. My daughter discovered this woman had, on her Facebook, had all these pictures of him and everything and confessing all her love for him and all. Linda canceled her holiday to Ghana. She believes Steve has since married the other woman and is now living in the UK. I never heard from him again and then I got an email from this woman telling me that they were married. So I was crushed. I mean, I was really crushed. After investing thousands of dollars in the relationship, Linda felt great shame that she'd been duped. She was offered no support from some of her neighbors in Texas. Some of my neighbors were not very happy with the fact that I had gone the first time and they were making some negative comments to me, but it made me feel like that I, I couldn't share my experience and I was suffering. I felt like I'd done something horribly wrong. I felt like I had let my husband down, Larry. I couldn't face people. The suffering and doubt that holiday love rats leave behind is something all of our women have struggled with. Those feelings have come on. How did I fall for this? I've been taken for an idiot. But it can happen to anybody. I lost all faith in myself. I lost faith in my judgments. I even thought about ending it all. This would be a simple way of getting uh, out of this situation. 
be take a very special man for me to trust again. But it would be a man that would understand where I'm coming from, um, that I've been hurt emotionally, financially, in every way. I doubt I'll ever have a relationship because of this, because as soon as I meet somebody, I start to question, is it real? I have absolutely no trust of anybody anymore. Julie's 33-year-old ex-husband, Lamin, left her just a few months after his UK visa arrived in 2010. But although he left Julie, Lamin never left Bournemouth, and now even trips to the local shop are emotionally demanding for Julie. Every time I see dreadlocks, I double take just in case it's him. I saw Lamin at the petrol station the other day, did not acknowledge me, drove off. I saw him at Bournemouth Hospital many times when he's just totally blanked me. If I had the chance to speak to him, I would say, you are one horrible, nasty, cold-hearted user. Makes me feel really angry. Wherever she goes, Julie is wary Lamin could be nearby, and every street is paved with memories. Toby Carberry, we used to like going there. That's where the Upside Down Shed came from. It's horrible living in the same town as him because you never know where you're going to go, where you're going to bump into him. I went past there one day and I saw him outside there chatting up a girl, a blonde. He's just um, living the dream. As she struggles to put the relationship behind her, care worker Julie is being treated for depression. When it comes to my love life, I'm rubbish. When people tell me, don't do this, don't do that, Julie, you're making a mistake. I'm just like, oh, shut up, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm a bit stubborn. And I saw it was lambing. I'll prove everybody wrong and it's going to work. But I regret it big time now. I feel stupid. I want some kind of closure, I guess. After her ex-husband Ahmed was sentenced to three years imprisonment in Tunisia, Dee thought he'd be deported. But unless the British police arrest Ahmed following an extradition request from Tunisia, he will remain living in the UK and evading Tunisian jail. Dee's sense of injustice has led her to set up a campaign and support group. Setting up immigration marriage fraud has given me a new focus and a new channel not only to help people, but to work off my stress. And I find you get satisfaction in people feeding back to you and say, thank you, I didn't know that there was such an organisation like yours. Dee is also campaigning for the government to help people involved in immigration marriage fraud. Many of these fraudsters are just laughing at the British people because our loopholes are there. They know what they call the long game and they will wait. And as soon as they get their visas, some of them within even one day of getting their visas will walk away from the marriage. Dee believes she is providing a vital service. These people are just devastated, really, as we all have been. And the good thing is that they're able to identify with you because you've been through a similar process. We have sent all Dee's allegations to Ahmed, but he has not responded. As Dee seeks changes in the UK law, American Linda Austin is hoping United States justice can catch up with Steve Charway. Today, she's visiting Sergeant Poppy in the Goliad Sheriff's Office to find out if anything can be done to recover her money. At, at this point, the case has been presented to the district attorney's office. You know, typically when we recommend an indictment, you know, they will do that. Um, once the indictment occurs, a warrant will be issued. Uh, then the difficult part begins yes. because um, he is in another country. We're actually not sure which country. Is he in Ghana? Is he in the UK? Is he elsewhere? But at least we're at the point now where criminal charges are being brought in the United States. Okay. Um, and from there, it, it's going to be a bit of a search, but we're hopeful.
What do you think the chances are of him being caught? And if so, what would the chances be of me getting my money back? The apprehension is going to be the more difficult part. As far as getting your money back, uh, that would be part of the sentencing process. One of the options that the judge has is to require that person to make restitution for the amount that you've lost. Complaints like this are an increasing problem for Sergeant Poppy and his team. Even in a small community like Goliad, this is emerging as a greater and greater problem all the time. I probably receive two or three incidents like this per week. With Sergeant Poppy on the case, Linda is feeling confident that United States justice will ultimately catch up with Steve. Steve wanted to come to the U.S., so I guess now he's going to get to, but he may not like his hotel. It really is bad to have this going on and to have the feeling of helplessness that nobody cares. So I'm very happily surprised that this is all fixing to come about. Julie has struggled emotionally since ex-husband Lamin left her weeks after his UK visa was confirmed. She is visiting leading psychologist Emma Kenny to try to come to terms with the anger and sadness Lamin has left behind. How are your feelings now? The way he treated you? I hate him. I hate him with a vengeance. In some way, he's taught you a valuable lesson, which is that you're not going to be used anymore. Yeah, yeah, he's taught me that. But um, I wouldn't have liked to learn it that way. And what is it for you that makes you think that he selected you? I'm some of a very kind kind of person. It's like I've got I listen or like mug written on my head. Oh, I care. I care, yeah. But when it gets thrown back in your face, that's a hard one to deal with. I wouldn't let anyone move in on me again. No way. I'm wondering whether it's more about learning to trust yourself, your choices and your understanding and gut instinct, as opposed to feeling like you can't have another relationship or move somebody into your world, which essentially means that Lamin's won. What has he taught you? Not to rush into anything. You know, listening to that gut nagging feeling in your head, those doubts, just uh, think a bit more about what the consequences can be. Sure. After. Emma's insight has struck a chord with Julie, who thinks her job had a big impact on her decision to enter a relationship with Lamin. For many years now, I've been in support work, supporting people with drug and alcohol issues, mental health issues, and I find it rewarding to help people. So maybe it was a bit of a project that I could help this man out of poverty and help improve his life. We have put all Julie's allegations to Lamin, but his reply was unsuitable for broadcast. Kim thinks she may be married to a bigamist who is attempting to claim her property via the divorce courts. As yet unable to prove social media claims of bigamy, Kim has travelled to Huddersfield to seek advice from family solicitor Jonathan James. I'm hoping that he's going to be able to give his expert eye as to which way we should be attacking this. If Kim can prove musician Lai married her bigamously, she will not have to go through a complicated divorce battle. We try to keep it as simple as we possibly can. So what I'm looking for in any particular case of this nature is, can I show on the documents there was a valid previous marriage? If you can show that, even out of a set of four other potential mm. marriages, you stick with that one, mm. because that one can be the killer punch that ends the case. Yeah. Otherwise, you're dragged into the whole uh, divorce finance swamp. Mm. And believe me, it's a swamp. I know. It's about dividing up what there is. It's about money. At the moment, it's all a bit of a mess, and people in our situation are stuck. Yes. It's complicated. It's drawn out. Mm. And because a lot of it is in your hands as a private mm. individual, the risk is that it gets really very expensive. Yes. 
Kim needs to find more hard evidence of the claims of bigamy. Until then, her case is set to remain ongoing. Kim has some hard decisions to take. Nobody enjoys having a courtroom fight, and she's going to have to weigh up the cost of doing that and whether she uh, grits her teeth, swallows her pride, and decides to keep as much money as she can and pay him something to get rid. And that really will go against the grain. Kim is willing to be patient in her battle with lie. It's just a waiting game at the moment to see what paper evidence that we can get together. But I won't stop until we've actually got some resolution. We have contacted Lai, but he has not responded to Kim's allegations. In Texas, Linda has become a recluse due to the embarrassment of being scammed by Ghanaian Steve Charway after her husband Larry passed away. She is meeting close friend Dolores at her local church to tell her for the first time the extent of the scam she was involved in. As you know, I went to Ghana and I was scammed. You know that much. I talked to this man for over a year and I loved him and then he took off with another woman. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. And that's why I've been out of sight from everybody. I was ashamed. And it just, it hurt. So, so everything he told you was a lie? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I was lonely. I just needed somebody to love me. I see how something like this could happen yeah. very easily. Even though you and I both knew our husbands were not going to be with us much longer, you think you're prepared, but the rug just yeah. comes out from under you. I'm very happy that I know the truth. And if you need someone to talk to, I know. You're a good friend. And so are you. It's been difficult for Linda to tell her story, but it's the first step to moving on with her life. Steve Charway admits to having an affair with Linda, but says there was a second man who disappeared just before Linda's arrival in Ghana. Steve says he gave $800 of Linda's money to his church. As they all attempt to rebuild their lives, each woman has come to their own conclusion about the overseas charmer they fell for. I don't believe my husband ever loved me for a moment. He loved what I could provide for him. I was a means to an end. I was an opportunity. I was a target. I don't cry about Lemmin anymore. I feel I'm not going to let that happen to me ever again. What has happened to me has made me very strong because many women I know in this position, they just want to sort of curl up and sort of just forget things, but no, not me. They don't love you, they don't care about you. All they care about is getting that money. I just wish my husband was back. If he was here, none of this would have ever happened.